Um, so the next topic that we're going into, it's sort of like the start of uh, physics topics, really. Um, we're going into kinematics of a particle in one dimension. Um, uh, whoops, the screen's not on. Oh, why is that? Oh, I know why. I'll be right back. Now it'll work better for taking notes and stuff. To kinematics of particles in one dimension. Uh, so first of all, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of words like this in this class. Let me just uh, go through what this means. Um, it's going to make a lot more sense out of things if you can distinguish between these terms. So um, first, kinematics. Um, that is uh, just describing the motion of an object uh, without um, dealing with any causes of the motion. So just describing motion without the causes. If you think of the causes being things like um, forces and mass, uh, you know, to make something move, you apply a force to it and get it going. Um, we're not going to deal with that. Uh, at first, um, I think uh, one way to think about kinematics is it's stuff that if you had the right like measurement equipment and stuff set up in a room, if you had the, uh, the floor and the ceiling and the walls all uh, showing uh, distances or whatever, you know, like grids across all of them. So wherever something was, you could tell where it was located. Um, Kinematics is all the things that you could measure from a videotape. Um, so like if you, if you had a video uh, of something moving, you wouldn't be able to, on the video, you wouldn't be able to measure its mass. You wouldn't be able to see how hard things are pushing on it or pulling on it. But you could tell how long it took from, for it to go from this spot to another spot. 
And so uh, all the things that you could measure, the position, how long it took to change from one position to another, its speed, its direction, um, those are kinematic quantities. So all the things you could measure from a video. Um, and the, um, the quantities that we're going to be dealing with are time, that's going to be represented as lowercase t, um, position, lowercase p, velocity, lowercase v, and acceleration, lowercase a. Um, so if you have calculations that include mass or force or energy, that'll be later on in the class, um, then you're not dealing with kinematics. You're dealing with something else. And that something else, the, um, what we're making a distinction, when we say kinematics, we're making a distinction between kinematics and this other thing called um, so as opposed to kinetics, why did they make these two words almost identical? I don't know. I wasn't there. But it seems like a bad idea. Uh, it probably has something to do with Latin. Um, so um, So when we start talking about kinetics, we're going to be including the causes of the motion. And the difference between these two words uh, is the ma in the middle. Like if your ma took a videotape of you, from that video you could measure kinematics. I don't know, that's a stupid one. Okay, and then, uh, so that's what kinematics means. Now we have to talk about what particles mean. Particle, the word particle means. Um, I think most people, uh, if they had to, um, had to say what they thought a particle was in physics, they would say um, that it deals with something small. And that, that is kind of in the right direction. Um, but um, you treat things as particles if you don't care about length dimensions of the object. When you treat something as a particle, you're treating it as if it has no length dimensions. Um, so it doesn't have to be something with negligible length. Um, when you do calculations about planetary motion, a lot of times you treat, most of the time, you treat planets and stars and stuff as particles. And obviously, by our standards, those don't have small length dimensions. Um, so this is something that is treated as having no length dimensions. Um, really, uh, the reason that you treat something as a particle is that you, you want to ignore um, changes in the object's orientation in your calculation. Um, so you choose. to treat an object as a particle
if changes in orientation don't matter to your analysis. Um, so the key thing here is that it has to do with what you're looking for more than it has to do with the object itself. Like, for example, a baseball flying through the air, would you treat that as a particle or not? Well, it depends on what your analysis is trying to do and, and what the motion is like of the, um, of the baseball. Uh, if you're trying to do an analysis of what a baseball would do, um, if there was negligible air resistance, you might treat it as a particle. If you're trying to figure out what the spin of a baseball is going to cause it to do, like in a curveball or something, then you can't ignore the changes in orientation anymore. The changes in orientation are what are going to make it take this funny shape through the air. And so in one case, you would treat it as a particle. In another, you wouldn't. So what I'm trying to say is things aren't particles or not particles. Uh, you decide whether it's a reasonable assumption to make based on what you're trying to calculate. Um, and then the last thing is one dimensional. Um, one dimensional means that at any instant, the object only has two. possible direction choices. The simplest example of one-dimensional motion is something moving along a line. Um, so, for example, uh, an object moving along a line So let's say there's the line, and you can imagine that being like a wire, and a here's a like a bead that slides along the wire. At any instant, no matter where it is on that thing, there are only two directions it can go. It can go to the left, your right, or the left. You know, um, it can't. It can't go this way, this way, any of those. Um, and we'll see that when, you know, if it if it was free to move anywhere along this screen, that would be two-dimensional motion. And we'll see that that brings up new complications. Uh, so we're going to first just imagine something that has a known path that can go one way or the other. Um, and we'll sort of get an introduction to all these the kind of tools of physics that we're going to use through the whole class before the math gets more complicated in two dimensions. Um, but notice one thing, uh, dimensional motion doesn't have to be along a line, although that's the, that's the one that we're going to deal with the most often. Uh, if the wire looked like this, and the bead could slide it along that wire, that's still one dimensional motion, even though um, Still, at any instant, that beat can only go this way or that way, so it's still one-dimensional motion. And the stuff that we're doing applies in both of those cases. All right, so um, what we need to do now, uh, we're going to talk about kinematics of a particle in 1D in terms of these 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, variables. And there's a couple more that I'll talk about briefly, but these are the main ones. And so uh, I need to define, well, time I'm going to 
I'm going to sort of leave alone. Uh, I'm not going to define that, but um, you can imagine just measuring how long it takes for from one instant to another. Uh, but I'm going to define position, mathematical position, like what position as a variable means to us, and then velocity and acceleration. So position is the first one I'm going to talk about. So let's say uh, there's train tracks going over this hilly ground, and here's the train rolling along. And it's like one of those old-timey trains, because that's the one kind I know how to draw. Uh -huh. um, and what we want to be able to do is say, so that train track is a one-dimensional path. At any instant, the train can go forward along the track or back along the track. Um, and we want a way to, uh, you know, position is a mathematical variable. So we want a way to, and a mathematical variable is like a number. So we want a way to represent the position of that train just by a single number. Okay. So what does it take to describe that train's location using a single number? Um, So to define an object's location, as a number, you first need to choose two things. Uh, the first one is you have to choose a physical location that you're going to call the zero position. You're Basically, you're choosing a reference position. Um, so physical location corresponding to what we're going to call zero position. Everything is going to be measured in terms of that thing. So uh, let's see. So let's say uh, there's a, OK. And we're going to call that the zero position. So I'll put a little scripty O there for origin. That's what we're going to call zero. So in this example, we're talking about the mailbox. And then the second thing you have to define is you have to choose uh, what direction you're going to call, call positive. So let's say a physical direction that you're going to call positive. And it doesn't matter uh, which direction you choose, um, you know, just like this sort of math way to think about number lines, I guess in this case I'm going to call positive uh, going to the right. But I could have chosen positive going to the left. And now that we've done that, I can count off what, you know, based on, you know, say that train is uh, six meters long or something. Uh, let's say this is about how long a meter would be.
we're going to represent the train as ha happening as being located at a single point because um, that's the idea of a particle. It just occurs at a single point. So I'm going to choose that as the location that we're going to call that the train's location. Uh, that's the center of mass symbol. Like remember that from like uh, crash test dummies in car commercials. So. Uh, Location is you know, where the track uh, intersects with that spot. And so now that, and not until we've made those two choices, now we can say that the train is at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's the train is nine meters in the negative direction from zero. So if you start at zero and go nine meters in the negative direction, what's what's the number, the position number? Negative nine, yep. Uh, so we chose to be positive. Um, and so the position is equal to negative nine and the units are meters, the units of length. You can do it with whatever measure of length. Um, you could do it in inches or whatever. And by the way, notice that uh, this really isn't any different than what you need to like describe something's location in words in everyday speech. Um, so if someone asked you where the train is, you know, at this location, you would say, you know, that mailbox, it's about nine meters, uh, whatever direction that is, say, nine meters south or whatever of that mailbox. You know, you've done, um, you've chosen that mailbox as your reference. And then you've said what direction you have to go from that reference to get to the object you're looking for. So we're just doing it in a sort of a more formal, like mathematical way, you know. Any questions about that so far? Okay. If you also, um, Choose an instant corresponds to zero time. You can associate each position. with a numeric time. Um, and so uh, the way to think about what you're doing there, if you choose an instant that you're going to call zero time, you can think about that's like when you turn on a stopwatch. OK? Uh, turning it on is what you're calling zero time. And everything after that has a positive time value associated with it. Um, like if you're timing someone in a 100 meter race, you know, uh, it's assumed that what you're going to call zero time is when the race starts, you know. Uh, that's important for defining that time. If you, if they run the 100 meter and, oh yeah, uh, fire alarm. So we have to go outside.
again? Uh, yeah, you can leave it. We'll be back in 15 minutes or something, 10 minutes. Hey, everybody, follow me to safety.
have your attention, please. We will now conduct a campus-wide evacuation drill. Please proceed to the nearest exit or stairwell and leave the building. Do not use the elevator. Again, this is only a drill. Thank you. <laughs> computer in while we were gone? Uh, oh, it was. Okay. <laughs> that would be awesome. <sighs> oh, my video is still going. That's great. Um, okay, so everyone ready? what position means. Um, and if you basically start a stopwatch and look at the stopwatch as these events happen, you can associate each individual position with a time. And if you do that, so then you could plot a position versus time
graph. And so what that looks like is uh, you have the time on the horizontal axis, and you have the position on the vertical axis. And whatever units you're using, we're going to usually use uh, units of meters for position and units of seconds for time. So you could have like, when you start your stopwatch, the thing could be at position positive two, and then at one second, it's at position one, and at two seconds, it's at position negative one, and then at three seconds, it's at position positive three, and so on. And uh, if you knew this for every time, you could fill out a whole graph like that, okay? In this case, um, you know the position as a function of time. And you could write that as position as a function of time, like this. And you've seen functions, you know, in math. So the idea is uh, you could express the position as a mathematical function where if you know the time, you can use that function to, uh, to give you the position. So for example, you could have that the position as a function of time is equal to uh, five times the cosine of 2t. And what that says is, uh, if, if you want to know the position at like five seconds, five seconds after the person has turned on the stopwatch, you plug five in for t, you get 10, the function is five times the cosine of 10, and whatever that is, is your position. Okay. So that's what we're heading towards, is um, finding ways to represent the position uh, as a function of the time. Any questions about this yet? Okay, so I'm going to do a couple of sort of example problems. And hopefully this will help show how this stuff all fits together. So let's say that there is, um, let's say that there's a house. And 20 meters away, there's a flower. And then uh, 10 more meters away, there's a car. Okay, the car is little. Or the flower is really big, I guess, really. Okay, so um, we know that the distance between the house and the flower is 20 meters. And we know that it's 10 more meters to get from the flower to the car. And let's say that a woman walks from the house
to the car in, how long does it take to walk 30 meters? Uh, Twenty seconds. Is that too fast? No, that's not so bad. That's good, I think. Okay, so the woman walks from the house to the car in twenty seconds. And then walks back to the flower. in 15 more seconds. And first, we're going to uh, say that we have to make those, if we're going to represent uh, a position versus time graph, which is what we want to do, um, we have to choose a zero position and a positive direction, and we also have to choose a zero time, a, a time that we turn on the stopwatch. So if our zero position is at the house, our positive direction is towards the car. And our zero time is when the woman starts walking. draw a position versus time graph. OK. So uh, let's think about it this way. So here is the, the path. And here's the house, and here's the flower, and here's the car. And the woman follows a path that goes like this. It starts at the house, it continues until it gets to the car, and then it goes back and ends here at the flower, okay? That's true before we've made any choices, you know. The, the woman's path doesn't depend at all on what we choose as zero position, zero time, all that stuff, right? The woman goes about her business. It's only when we start, it's only for trying to put numbers on this stuff that our choices matter, okay? So what they have up there so far is independent of our choices. Um, but now let's start to use the information that's given in the question for part A. So zero position is at the house. And what we're going to want to do is come up with numeric labels for all these different position values for all these different uh, So this is the easy one. We're calling this position zero. So the numeric label for that is zero. I'll write it as a O for origin. And so whenever something's at the house, its position value is zero. Uh, we're choosing a positive direction toward the car. That's given in the question. And so if it's 20 meters from the house to the flower, and to get to the flower, you have to go 20 meters in the positive direction. 
what's the numeric label at the flower? Positive 20, yep. And then if it's 10 more meters from there in the positive direction, what's the numeric label for the car? 30, yep. Because what matters is your position compared to that reference point, the zero. So this is positive 30. And I guess let's write the units on all these. So 20 meters, 30 meters. And now let's think about uh, when the woman gets to all these different locations. Uh, so first she passes the flower. We don't have any information about that. But we do have information about how long it takes to go from here to here. Okay. Um, and I guess before that, uh, at the instant she leaves the house, what do we know about what the stopwatch says? Well, it says the time is zero when she starts walking. So we know that right at this instant, when she's here leaving the, leaving the house, we're going to call that time zero. Okay, so uh, this is time equals zero. And how long did it take for her to get from the house to the car? 20 seconds. So uh, if you add 20 seconds to zero, you get 20 seconds. And then it's another 10 second, uh, another 15 seconds. What did I say? It's another 15 seconds to get back to the flower. So what does the stopwatch say at that point? 35. And now I'm just going to fill out like a little table of the, um, the instance that we know about, the time value and the position value. So the first instant we know about is time equals zero. And at time equals zero, the position is equal to zero. That doesn't have to be the case. It's just the case in this example. Uh, the second instant we know about, the time is 20 seconds. And the position is what? Positive 30, yep. And then the third instant we know about, the time is 35 seconds. And what's the position? 20, yep. And so a position versus time graph now is just a matter of plotting those points. Um, the time is always on the horizontal. And uh, I'm going to write in parentheses the units we're using, seconds. And up here is the, uh, the vertical is the position, and the units there are meters. Um, and I'm going to count by five, so... Uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. And then for position, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. And that's the highest number we see for position. And now plotting these three points, we have zero on the x-axis, zero on the y-axis. Then we have 20 on the x-axis, 30 on the y-axis. And then the last one is 35 on the x-axis, 20 on the y-axis. And then we don't have any more information about what happens in between these points, so you can sort of connect it however you want. It would be something sort of like that. But 
could you could make them straight lines or whatever. We don't know any details. Um, as far as we know, you know, it could. As far as we know, it could be doing this, this kind of thing. We don't know. All we know is those three points. We know that something happens in between those points. Any questions about that? Okay, so now, uh, like I said, before you can do this, you have to make those choices about zero position, zero time, positive direction. So what if we had made different choices? You know? So let's let's do it again. So now if the zero position Is it the flower? Positive direction. Is toward the house. And the zero time. Is five seconds before the woman leaves the house. Graph the position versus time. Okay, so I know on your note notebooks you don't have this feature. Actually, I don't know if I do with the Chrome collection tool. But I just I'm just doing this to emphasize that um, the motion itself you don't have any control over. Okay, so uh, copy. Paste. Now I gotta erase a million things. Um, so all these numeric values, those don't apply anymore. Those were dependent on what we chose, those three choices we made. But the motion itself, uh, that's exactly what it was before, you know? The woman still starts at the house, goes past the flower to the car, and then back to the flower. Right? And yes. Yeah. Further? Okay. So in coming up with the these numeric values, I'm gonna start with the exact same little sketch that I of the motion that I did before. Okay, that didn't, because it didn't change. But now, um, now we're going to put different numeric labels on, depending on our new three choices. Uh, so this time it says that the zero position is at the flower. So I'll say that's the origin. And this time the positive direction is from the origin towards the house. So what's the distance between the house and the flower? 20 meters, yep. Um, so if you start at zero and go 20 meters in the positive direction, what's the numeric label for the house? That's positive 20 over there. Okay. 
And now we want the numeric label for the car. Um, so this time, this is positive, that has to be negative. So now we're talking about going 10 meters, starting at zero and going 10 meters in the negative direction. So what's the numeric position at the car? Negative 10. Okay, now let's think about the times. Uh, so this time it says that stopwatch goes on, and then you wait five seconds, and when the stopwatch says five, the woman starts walking. So at this instant here, what's the time? That's positive five. With time, we're never going to deal with negative time. So, uh, so this is five seconds. And then how long does it take to get from the house to the car? 20 seconds. So if you start at 5 and then add 20 seconds, what do you get over here? So that's 25 seconds. And then it takes, what, another 15 seconds? So what does the stopwatch say when she gets back to the flower? Um, and I'm going to just write it out as a little table of coordinates again. So the first known pair of time and position is the time 5 seconds and the position positive 20 meters. The second one is time 25 seconds and position negative 10 meters and then the last one is time 40 seconds and position 0 so let's plot this one We have time in seconds on the x-axis and position in meters on the y-axis. And for times, uh, we have to go up to 40. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. And then for positions, uh, we have so 5, 10, 15, 20. And in the negative direction, negative 5, negative 10. And now we'll just read off these coordinates. Uh, the first one we know is. Uh, 5 horizontally and 20 vertically. So there. The second one is 25 horizontally, negative 10 vertically. So there. And then the last one is 40 horizontally, 0 vertically. So there. And the curve would look something like that. Yep. Zero. So um, with the zero position, that's correct. Um, you could. Uh, so all you're doing when you choose your zero position is saying what you're going to measure in reference to, you know? And so there's no reason that, you know, if something's moving around like this, you could choose your reference to be 100 miles away if you want. 
And then when you hit the stopwatch, you know, that would never be at zero through the whole motion. So that choice of zero position and where the thing is at zero time are two totally different locations. And, and that's going to be sort of a, a key thing that's going to be kind of tricky as we go on. But, but yeah, zero position is just a reference. Um, the thing's position at time equals zero, uh, well, it has to do with when you turn on the stopwatch and, you know, it depends on your reference position, but it's not the same thing. And notice uh, this isn't really too important uh, for doing problems and stuff, but notice that um, making those different choices uh, change the graph considerably, you know, like that graph depends on those three choices. Um, notice that if you go back and forth between these two, uh, choosing your zero time has the effect of shifting it horizontally, moving it back and forth horizontally. Choosing, you know, changing your choice of zero position determines where it's shifted vertically. And uh, your choice of which way is positive has the effect of flipping it one way or the other. If you look at the other one, it's flipped upside down. Um, and so the answers that we're getting here are only answers for our choices of zero position, positive direction, and zero time. There, there are going to be some things that, uh, you know, there will be some questions that ask something that we can answer in like an absolute way. But for the most part, overall, um, we're only going to give answers that are specific to our choices of reference, you know. It's, yes. Yeah. Uh, because I think it took, so the whole walk takes 35 seconds, right? And um, for part B, it said that the zero time is five seconds before she landed. So think of the stopwatch there. She's standing here at the door, clicks the stopwatch on, and time goes one, two, three, and then she leaves. And so uh, now, starting at five, you count 20 more seconds to get to the car. So now it's at 25. And then from there, it takes 15 seconds. It says it takes her, I hope that's right. I hope that's what I said. Uh, it takes 15 seconds to get from the car back to the flower. You know, you're at 25, so add 15 and you're at 40. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. Any other questions about that? Okay. Uh, let me give you a problem. And uh, you can see if you can think through this, uh, talk to each other or talk to me if you get stuck or whatever. And then uh, before class ends, I'll, I'll go through it and you can sort of see, you know, compare what you're thinking to how it works. So let's say that there is a, um, so there's a person. I'm going to be just drawing this picture for the rest of class. Okay, there's a person. And uh, the person's on the shore. And then out here, there was like uh, a raft. And then out here, there's a boat, you know. 
connected to a buoy. And so let's say this is, uh, this distance is uh, 10 meters. This distance is five meters. And let's say that the person goes um, from the shore to the boat in uh, 60 seconds. from the boat to the raft in 30 seconds. Okay, this is a really slow swimmer. Um, and then from the raft back to the boat in 20 seconds. So we'll choose our zero position at the raft. Our positive direction is toward the boat. And zero time is when the swimmer leaves the shore. Plot a position versus time graph. Um, and you know what, actually, uh, why don't you, um, so there's not going to be an assignment besides a reading assignment for Monday, um, but why don't you, if you have the time, should I have the time, uh, see if you can work through this and then I'll go through it first thing on, on Monday in class. Okay.